Hi everybody, this is Flash Zero Zero One USA and it's September 1st, 2013. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon here. Now this is my second how-to video and what we're going to do today is cover the rest of the build for just the gasifier itself. What I'm going to do now is let you guys get a look at everything and then we'll come back and look at everything closer and I'll give you some explanations here. All right, the first place we're going to start is where the gas itself outputs on this thing. And we'll zoom in just a little bit. This is my threaded coupler that's coming in through the top of the lid. And if you notice, I've got what looks like a bow tie on it. These here are made to keep the stress off of it. You don't want to just cut a hole into your um, top of your lid and screw something in and weld it in because you're asking for trouble and you won't have any tensile strength. So what you want to do is spread it spread the the any kind of stress this thing may have on it and I did that by cutting these little bow tie pieces and welding them here 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 and here and of course I've got it um, sealed up around the bottom here too so that eliminated any issues as far as having a fracture on it so you want to do that by the way right here is the output of the gas okay let's look at where the fresh air intakes on this thing this is my on and off valve for the fresh air that controls it I've got a T connector here and of course I've got it capped off on the side here but it goes right into the side with another threaded coupler and it's nice and airtight the pipe comes down and the fresh air is carried to the nozzle right over to the ember bed and that's how I have this set up now originally I could have used a 90 degree on here but I used a T because as I said in some past videos I was wanting to leave the gasifier where I could modify it and play around with it so I was trying to think ahead of the game to give me some wiggle room on this thing and I actually had some nozzles set up in this, just like a standard invert. It went here, here, and went over here. As a matter of fact, I got one of the nozzles. I'm going to let you look at it, and I'm going to zoom in on it. You can see how hot the steel got. You see how scorched it is. That's why I'm saying you've got to be able to set your setup so that you can change parts on it, because they will burn off on the ends, given enough time. And that's one beauty of having that top nozzle going into the top, is it's just as easy as changing a light bulb. I didn't like the way it ran. I just didn't like the feel of it, so that's why I decided to go back to the single nozzle design. Okay, now for the record, this rim right here is exactly what I built in video one. It's a carbon copy of it, minus these pieces right here that allowed me to put air nozzles on it. These are now here for decoration. So the holes have been plugged up in here. Originally, I was gonna go ahead and cut this one off and put the new one on it, and I thought, no, you know, why fix something that isn't broken because I got to looking at the steel in here, and guess what? This steel is not, it's not burnt or anything whatsoever. And I think that all that has to do with the concrete that's um, acting like a heat sink, so there's no use changing it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that new build that I did in video one onto one of the other gas fires I got downstairs. Okay, let's look at the side port ignition. If you remember, I was showing you in that video, I had that piece of steel steel uh, tubing laid on top of it. I said, look, this isn't really welded on here. Well, what I needed to tell you and what I was trying to relay is this is what you got to do. This um, side port needs to be flush with the top of this lid. So you have to go to your rim, take your grinder or whatever, cut you a mouse hole out. And then that way your pipe will sit flush with it and you can set everything down. You won't have any issues. Now this pipe here, just like I showed in the other video, he goes inside, he's just right flush at the edge of the fire cone. Okay, and I used a short piece of pipe, he's threaded on this end here. I got a coupler here, and that was for a reason also. Because I wanted to be able to find the exact length pipe that I needed to come out of the gasifier into the real world. I didn't want something that was going to be protruding too far or too short. And this guy here, I mean, he literally unscrews, okay. Now when I put them together, I'll tighten them down with a, a good set of channel locks and whatnot so he can't fall apart on me or come loose. And of course, there's the ignition port that you see on the outside of the gas fire. So I'm hoping that makes sense. Now what we're going to cover right now is going to be the actual wood hopper itself. This is an old decommissioned fuel tank for a heister. It's a propane tank. And basically what I've done is I've cut the top of it off right where my hand's at here would have been the top of it where you had the on and off nozzle and everything on the spigot and had all the gauges on it to see how much propane was in the tank. And this thing was actually full of all sorts of pipes and everything when I cut it apart. 
but you take the top of it off. You got to be sure to cut it off nice and smooth. Do not use a grinder to cut it. Use a jigsaw or something where you can get a machine cut on it because you don't want the thing wavering because if you do, you'll never get a seal. And if you screw up and, and do have it wavering and you weld that top piece of metal to it, guess what? Your lid will never seal. On the bottom side of this thing, which is where the actual fire cone itself goes, because my fire cone was six inches in diameter, I cut the hole in this thing at seven inches. I wanted a half inch gap from that fire cone to the internal cement. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason I did that is I wanted to be sure that any residuals, as far as moisture that was, could have possibly been left in this, had a way of evaporating out. I didn't want anything that could build up pressure or cause any kind of issues in the future. So now back to the wood hopper here. This is the exact same diameter. This is off of a large tank that I had. It's like a four foot tank that I wound up cutting up and um, using for other projects. This is a lid for the top of that is uh, where the wood goes into it. Exact same thing that's on the bottom side or the top side of that. Okay, notice he sits right up here. This happened to be, as far as this tank right here, was 12 and a quarter inches. So I cut it um, where I had a half inch overshoot on each side of this lip here. From the other words, I made sure that I have overhang was half inch on this guy right here. So you figure um, I cut it um, 13 and a quarter inches, basically, is what I cut it. And I did that so I could get a good bead welded on the bottom of this thing. And this also explains why you have to cut the top of this absolutely level. If you don't, this lid will sit here and be warped, and you'll never get a seal with your lid no matter what you do. It'll take an act to Congress. So just be aware of that. But all I did was cut a piece of steel out, and I think my internal hole here, I want to say it's seven inches. Let me pull the tape measure out here. Yeah, it's seven inches on the button, guys, so it don't need to be a big giant hole. Um, you could even go six inches. You know, you just want to be able to get your wood in there. And of course, the lid goes and closes down on top of this thing, but there it is. And I want to give you that explanation right there. I'm going to flip this thing upside down, or flip it back up on its right side up. And we're going to take a look at the top of this thing, and I'm going to give you some basic explanations here also. Stand by. Okay, this is the top view, and we're going to go ahead and continue covering the wood hopper. Let you get a good close look at this. Notice I've got this thing bolted in here. Like you would see an old steam engine locomotive or something. Now, I'm going to tell you why I did this. I could have just welded it to the lid if I'd have wanted to, but I didn't. And I had a reason for it. Metal likes to warp when you're welding on it if you're not careful, especially for those of us that aren't really skilled in this. Well, it doesn't anybody, but those that do this professionally know how to work around it and get the job done right the first time. And basically, I could have taken this guy and just put him in the barrel and clamped him down to keep it straight and welded it in, but I decided not to. Instead, guys, I made a ring, okay? And I welded the ring to the wood hopper. And after I cut my hole inside this lid here, I dropped him down in there, used RTV cement, and I bolted him in place. That's why I did that. It makes life simpler because although the ring did warp with me, I had me a flat surface and I was able to go around with a small sledgehammer and get it perfectly flat. And that made it marry up so good to this lid. And I'm going to show you how I made the ring. I don't have the full size ring here, but I got one for a smaller gasifier that I was building. That's what I did right there. Okay. I've got a total of 16 bolts in this thing. 16 bolts holds them down and it works perfect. Now, as far as my hinges goes, I made my own hinges. I made them out of steel here and fabricated everything. That's the straightforward. Now, you can use a good hinge um, from the hardware store, but you may have a problem with it. want the dance back and forth. That's why I use this flat pieces of steel right here and um, use the, the rectangle stuff here because I wanted to be sure that I didn't have any play in this thing. So I decided to go ahead and custom build my own hinges. But you can do however you want to do, just as long as it's right, that's the bottom line. But if you notice on this hinge, you notice it comes up and then it has to protrude out and then over. That's because I got that lip hanging over that I was talking about. Remember, this thing's a half inch oversized from the hopper all the way around. And also, to let you know, just to be on the safe side, it wasn't leaking, but I went inside of it with my finger and ran RBT cement all around the inside of this thing. I made sure, guys, I made absolutely sure I wasn't going to have leakage issues with this. My lid is the bottom of an old propane tank, but you don't have to do that either. 
If you want to, you can turn back around and cut you a flat piece of metal like this and make a lid out of anything that, that suits your needs, okay? I just did it like that because I thought it would look cool, but it made it harder to seal. I'm not going to lie to you because now I had an angle here, but after I ran it two or three times, it seals airtight. I'm not worried about it, so it's up to snuff and everything is like it should be in the universe of gasifiers. All right, this is my air nozzle with all the changes that I put on it, so it's been upgraded, and the job come off really good. I can tell you right now that it made it extremely user-friendly to be able to pull parts off of it and work on it on the fly. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to scan over it and let you get a good look at it. We'll also be taking a look at this thing in the next clip actually mounted up inside the gas fire. By that time, it'll all make good sense to you what you're looking at here. I felt the best way to show you guys was just to let you see this thing assembled, disassembled, and then put back together inside the gas fire. Okay, let's start at the top of this thing here. This is my one and a quarter inch 90 degree elbow. As you can see at the top of it, I got a piece of steel welded onto it. And on the steel, I've got a hole drilled in it, and I've got a 5 16 nut welded to it. And I've got a 5 16 bolt that goes to this guy. And what he does, once he's screwed inside of the gasifier to the coupler that's coming through, this thing here will actually screw up, and this will butt up against the wall of the wood hopper itself. This keeps him stable so that he can't swing back and forth, because unfortunately, when you screw this thing in, it may not necessarily line up tight where you need it to, so you have to have some way of securing it once you get it centered. So that's what I did right there. Okay. By the way, I need to bring something up here too. When you go to screw this in the gas to fire, I have to, on mine, i got to put him in first, and then I take everything else and put it in second. And um, if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to get it in place in there. This is the coupler, and I just reduced one time, and then I turned back around, and I took a straight coupler, a half-inch straight coupler, and I actually welded him right here to the bottom of this coupler because I did have three reducing couplers to get down to the proper size for my nozzle. So instead, I just decided to make it simpler and cut out some of the pieces. Okay. What I made here is a slip sleeve, and I've already got this thing loosened up. I'm going to pull them apart here. Or try to. Okay. You see how it goes on here? This isn't the prettiest job. I'm telling you right now, this was really hard doing this with the welder that I had. I actually went and got me a acetylene welder, so I've got me something that's good now for, for gas, for doing stuff like this. But it did come off good. It's good and solid, so the main thing is, is it works. Everything here is 5 16 also. By the way, this piece of pipe here, 3 quarter inch plumbing pipe. And um, just happens to be that if you cut the threaded ends off the 3 quarter inch pipe and take a file and go inside of it and clean it up, it slides right over the half inch pipe. So you can see what the trick is right here. And basically, as you've seen how this thing was set up, the slip sleeve slides up. This allows me to take the nozzle and go inside and slide them up and actually bring them down or what i got to do, whatever I need to do to get him positioned over the fire cone. And then of course I lock these two guys in place and the job is done. Now when you do this, you need to put something like um, anti-seize, like you put on spark plugs in a car, put it on your uh, nuts and bolts. This will protect everything. It's not that it's going to get so hot in there, but you don't want anything settling and causing these guys to seize up any kind of rust. For that matter, you probably could use good axle grease with it. Just anything to protect your threads and everything. You know, the whole idea behind doing this was to make this thing user-friendly. And as I said, if I had to change out the nozzle as I burn it up in time, all i got to do is pull this piece out. He never goes. He's, he'll always be here. This will stay. All i got to do is unscrew my pipe and put a new one on right here. Now, there's two ways of making sure that he stays positioned. When I screwed this guy on, he didn't tighten up where I needed him to. He tightened up and he's about sideways, like where my finger's at right now. And you can't have this thing flopping in there, so you can do it two ways. You can either screw him down and take your welder and just tack weld one place. Just enough so that he's tight. Or, do like I did. I actually took the threads on this guy and I sliced off like a sixteenth of an inch with a grinder. And then I would tighten it back in there. And I did this, I did it, it took me three times, and what I wound up with 
was I wound up being able to get this thing extremely tight where it was facing the exact direction that I needed to be facing, which is straight down like this. But um, that's it right there. And for some of you guys out there that may use a larger nozzle because you're going to be running something like maybe a 12 and a half horsepower Briggs or something like that, you'll want to go with three quarter inch stuff. Where I'm going with half inch, you'll want to go with just a little bit bigger stuff, okay? But there it is. And what we're going to do now is we're going to pause that. I'm going to put this thing back into the gasifier and we're going to see it actually mounted up. Let's take a look at how the air nozzle physically mounts up inside of the gasifier. To do this, I'm going to try to get inside of the wood hopper with the camera and scan it around in there and let you guys look at this. All right, that should give you an idea of how everything works mechanically, and um, hopefully that will help you. So let's move to the next part of this video. Okay, this is the shaker arm assembly. Now, you notice you got the long piece, and you got this guy here that you go here and out like this, like a set of stairs almost. This is the guy that's going to be inside of the unit to shake the grate back and forth. And this guy here is what gives you the rotating effect back and forth. Now this piece here, he protrudes through this guy right here from the inside to come out. So basically to be able to assemble this thing, this guy's got to come off. I've already unbolted him to keep the video simpler. And um, I'll have to go inside the door and from the inside pull him through so that this piece here is sticking out here. So with that said, I'm going to pause the video and then I'm going to actually going to do this and then we'll come back and see this thing in action. What you're looking at is the ash grate along with the shaker arm assembly for this new gasifier that I've just constructed. And rather than trying to draw up a set of plans, I felt that video would be the better avenue of explaining how to build this thing. Besides that, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is going to be worth many more. With that said, let's get started, and I'm going to explain this one section at a time, starting with this guy right here. This is the ash grate itself, and for mine, I used a six inch end cap for a wood stove. This is what you normally use in a room that's not being used with a wood stove, so you can keep the smell of creosote out of the house, or some people like to use them in the summertime when they're not using a wood stove, they'll basically disconnect it and cap their fireplace off, or their chimney off, so the smell of creosote doesn't come back through the house. With that said, this one is six inches. Let you see it right here. And I think they're about two inches deep. Let's see here. Yeah, right at two inches deep. Now, you'll notice there's holes drilled in this thing for the ash and the embers to be able to fall through. You don't want to go in this thing and just drill random. There's a better way of doing that, and I'm going to show you exactly how. What I did, went to my computer, and I use Microsoft Publisher, but you could use a thousand billion zillion programs to do the same thing. I drew me up a template. Notice I got little bullseyes and everything, okay? What I did is I cut this out with a pair of scissors. Before any of this stuff was mounted on here, I flipped them upside down and I taped them on here. Okay, so he was taped up here like this. I took a small punch and put indentations all the way around this thing on every single one of these guys. Then I took a 1 8 inch drill bit and I made me pilot holes in this thing. I turned back around and I drilled out 3 8 inch holes on this thing for the embers and stuff. I started to use a half inch size but it was just too much trust me don't need it i didn't have it on my other one besides that with all these holes it's not going to have any issues with it getting clogged up now with that said we're going to look at some other parts here notice there's three hooks okay 
Each one of these guys is set off from 120 degrees offset from the other one. Inside of my unit down here, I've got the chains that are hanging and this guy will hang up on it. But there's a little trick I did on this. Notice I've got these hooks. See this? They're these uh, like 59 cent hooks, okay? I took them and spread them open just big enough for the chain to go in there. So when it's hanging, it'll hang like this right here. But it can't come off and it can't slide forward because I've got a washer right here held in place with a couple of nuts. So I did that on all three of them. Now, if you notice on the inside of them, you uh, drill the holes, tighten them up, make sure they're all facing down. These are about a half inch up from the bottom, something like that. It's not critical. As you build this yourself, you'll do it to your own taste and for your own specifications. I think the whole idea that I want to drive home here is exactly how to do this because it works perfect and then some. Now, this funny looking thing here. He was nothing more than a big old piece of straight threaded rod, okay? And um, basically, I want you to get a good look at him and see what I did here. I'm going to try to give you the side view of it. Now I'm going to explain how this works. And this piece here will go in like this. And I'm hoping the video shows up good on this. Where I've got my fingers right here, my fingers right here, he will represent the piece of steel that's going through the barrel itself that holds this steel. And what happens is this rotates back and forth and shakes it. Okay? That's how this works. Now this stuff here is hard to bend without breaking it. So what you got to do is heat it up with a torch and bend it real slow. And then to get this opened up here, I basically took a pair of pliers and a drill bit and I put it up in there and bent it to keep him opened and keep him uniform. Now I'm going to tell you the size that I made mine right here. And um, this may help you. It's right at about five, five and a half inches, okay? And then the side piece here is sticking out about three inches. So you figure 16 inches was the total length of this and then everything was bent to be shaped like this. Now, the way this works is, is when this guy's hanging off the chains, he's free hanging, and this will just bounce back and forth like this, especially as you swing this around like this. I'm going to go ahead and put this thing back together. I'm going to pause the video out and I'm going to put him back inside of the unit and then I'm going to put the camera inside of the barrel itself and let you see this thing in action. It's very cool and the good thing about it is, like I said from my previous videos, I designed this thing to be worked on. I designed this thing where I could just get in there at the drop of a hat, pull these pipe pieces off and replace them, fix them, modify them, etc., etc., and then some more, etc. With that said, I'm going to pause out and we're going to come back and you're going to see this thing in action. Okay, I've got the shaker grade assembly put back into place here. So everything is hooked up. The linkage is ready to go. I'm going to get inside of here and hopefully you'll be able to see this and make sense of it. Naturally, you're looking at the bottom of the grade. So bear with me as I spin this camera, people. I'm flying blind here, okay? What I want you to see right now is exactly the way this thing comes inside here. The way... It there you go. This is on the inside of the barrel, and I'm spinning the handle on the outside to see it shake in the arm. So I can get this in focus, I need to get further away from it so you can see this thing in action. Okay, I'm going to do the slow motion so you can see it. You can see this is going to shake the ever loving dog poop out of this thing, okay? Now let's take a look at this guy here. And this thing works really good. Now, there's another way of shaking this thing, too, and that's just by going back and forth. And to me, I found that to be the most effective way with the other one because you're actually putting vibration into it. And uh, when you turn the handle all the way around, it's just for stirring the ashes up and spreading them out across the whole bottom. But when you take this guy and go just back and forth, it's like a salt and pepper shaker. I mean, it just shakes everything clean. But there it is. I hope this makes sense to you. And um, as I said, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video's going to be worth many more. I think this is just the best way, to, you know, to let you guys see this thing in actual operation. And for those of you that are seriously considering doing this, hopefully this will help you, okay? So there you go. There's one more upgrade that I want to make everybody aware of. And this pertains to the ash grade itself. 
Now all of the video that you just got through viewing, none of the measurements on how to construct this change. Everything stays the same. The only difference is, was I beefed it up. So on the back side of it right here, where this bent rod comes out for the shaker arm assembly to shake it with, I put me a 16th inch piece of steel plate back there. I'm going to zoom in on it. And I've got four little screws and bolts on it, well two actually, two at the top to keep it in place. And of course the rod is the other two that's going through the bottom of it. Now once this was bolted through, this gave it a lot of tensile strength and I also tack welded it at the bottom so this can never shake loose. And I tack welded it on the inside. I also tack welded the hooks on the inside to keep everything nice and snug. That was the only thing that I seen that was wrong with this after running it a couple of times. Also, the spread on this guy here needs to be exactly one inch or even an inch and a quarter. So be aware of that also, just to give you a little bit more information there. All right, let's get back to the video and finish this thing up. All right, everybody, the sun is set on me, but I've only got just a little bit more left to cover on the construction of the gasifier itself. And because of that, I decided to go ahead and break out a light here so that I can finish up this second how-to video. What I'm going to be covering is basically just the ash removal port and I'm briefly going to cover the shaker grate handle sticking out, and I'm briefly going to be covering the ignition port. Let's get started. Okay, let's start with the ash removal port. Now this is two pieces of steel. I've got the piece that's mounted to the barrel itself, and the second piece naturally is the door. Now the main piece on the back right here serves two purposes. The first one is, I just like the cosmetics of it, but that's not the main reason I put it on there. The main reason I put it on here was to give this barrel tensile strength. This stuff is 16th of an inch thick. I'm not sure if it's stainless or not. It hadn't rusted. So there must be some galvanization to it or whatnot. I'm not sure. It could be some sort of stainless steel material or something, but it's still shiny, so I'm the, the verdict's out on that. But what I did is I cut this piece out. His measurements are 14 inches wide. Now this is the piece mounted to the barrel by 9 3 quarters inch tall. And I cut them out, and I kept in mind, hey, that I've got this roll on the barrel right here. So I made sure that it wasn't too tall so that it would be up against this, so that would be impossible to get a seal on it. I also left me about a half inch gap at the bottom here where the steel's at. Now, I didn't cut any holes for the doors or anything when I mounted this on here. Basically, I cut the piece of steel, and I had to roll it to put that shape to it to go to the barrel. And what I did is I got a piece of scrap pipe that I made a femur with. So I basically put that piece of steel on here and, and used both of my hands and rolled it back and forth until I put the shape to it, until it fit the barrel like a glove. Now once that was done, I went ahead and went around this guy with RTV cement and went all the way around it, including where I knew where the door was going to be on it. And I had all the holes already marked off on the steel. As a matter of fact, the screws are one inch apart all the way around on this thing. And I went ahead and bolted this thing on here. That was the first thing I did. Then I cut the hole for the door, okay? That was after the fact, and I did it with a jigsaw. I did it with a quality jigsaw with good fine tooth steel blades so I didn't have anything grabbing or ripping on me. That was the first thing I did. So once again, 14 inches wide by nine and three quarter inches tall. Make sure to leave you a gap at the bottom. I left a half inch on mine, and I made sure pretty much to have a, probably about a half inch before the roll started on the barrel. Now the door itself, the door itself is going to be nine and a half inches wide by seven and quarter, one quarter inches tall. I did the same thing to get his shape. I put him on the piece of steel that I got right here and I rolled him back and forth until he fit on there. Also, once that was done, I had to make sure that I mounted the door on here. I, he's, notice he's not dead center of the steel. There's more of a space here than there is here. That's because I had to accommodate for latches on this side right here. And... Um, for you, you, know, you may use different latches, so you may set your door up slightly different than I had on mine. But basically this is just to put you on track or give you ideas so that you know how to do it. I'm going to make a suggestion here too, and something to think about. You may be better off using an ammo can. It would definitely make it simpler. Now the one advantage that I have on this is because I've got this door here, which my door hole is actually 4 and 3 fourths inches tall by 7 inches wide. This allowed me a lot of room to get my hands in here and work on things, so that was one big plus. But you can find some pretty big ammo cans that would fit the criteria also. So it would be simpler, I won't lie to you, but I did this just because it was a challenge and it was fun doing it at the time. So that's your call however you decide to do it. 
Now I want to cover the shaper grade handle here. Notice that he's not on the roll either. So when you're building the gas fire, if you use a 55 gallon drum or any drum for that matter, that's got rolls on it, think outside the box. When you're, when you're setting everything up, you gotta be, hey look, I need to make sure that um, I'm not trying to mount anything on some weird place on the barrel because if you do, it'll make it real hard to work with. It's, you're better off working with a, with a flat surface than something that's got a roll on it. So he's basically sitting right above this roll right here. The same thing with the ignition port, okay? Now, what I want to cover on the ignition port is, is I cut this hole, I oversized this hole, I think by about a quarter of an inch all the way around, maybe even a little bit more than that, but not much more, okay? Now, this pipe here, I think it's one inch pipe is what it is. Let me see here, yeah. I used a one inch ignition pipe for mine, so I think I cut the hole maybe one and a half inches in diameter because I wanted play on this thing so that I knew that I would be able to get it mounted up properly to the ignition port that's mounted on the cone itself. And if I'd have cut this hole perfect, I would have had to go on in here with the file, so I just saved myself the headache. It's the same thing a carpenter does when they're building cabinets in a house or whatnot where they, you know, they, they use the, the pieces that are going to be covering up the imperfections whether it's the, the sidings or whatnot or, the, or whatever the pieces they cut to put around the, the woodwork to give it the polished look. And that's, so this serves two purposes. First of all, it gave me a polished look on here, but the main thing is, is because I had cut the hole oversized, I had to make sure that it would still seal properly. And I didn't want to mess with all this and goop with all this um, RTV cement, so I cut this hole right here really tight to the point that I had to screw them over the threads to get them on here. And um, once again, I think these screws are like one inch apart from each other. I've got eight screws on it, so I did it on the computer. I just sat down and said, hey, look, I got this diameter circle, and I wanted to make sure I had the, the proper number of screws around it so that it kind of looked cosmetically good, okay? So that it was all about cosmetics also. But that's basically it, okay? That's um, basically covers what I wanted to cover on this part of the video. Now, somebody did contact me today and they were asking me hey look you know I've got a choice uh, between barrels I've got uh, an opportunity to get some that have uh, solid tops on them and some that have the removal lids well I use a removable lid on mine I've got this snap ring now I don't know what kind of material they used on the gasket but I'm gonna tell you right now it's some sort of hard white material rubber material and the heat has not hurt it one bit because I've pulled this thing apart a couple of times playing around with it and that gasket looks like it's never been exposed to heat. But if you've got one, if you've got an opportunity to get one that's got a snap ring on it, I would use that. Personally, that's the route I would go. And also, keep this in mind too, if you don't trust your gasket, if you think it's some soft, spongy material that's going to melt, pull it out, go get you some fiberglass rope that would go in a fireplace, use that red RTV cement and make you a gasket for your barrel. And if you do that, you're going to be good to go. I couldn't be more pleased with the materials I have on here and I could have made this thing a lot smaller, okay? I could have made this thing really, really small. I made it big like this because I was able to get these barrels, first of all, really cheap. Another reason was um, I don't like working on foreign cars because they're so small and I didn't want a gasifier that was going to be cutting my hands and breaking my wrist for every move I went on them. So I made it with this right here. That was, that was my reason. There was another benefit I got off of this. Because it's a little bit bigger, I was able to put a larger wood hopper on it and the gas has room to expand and actually lose some heat in this thing. So that actually aids in cooling the gas now before it exits out of here. So there was a couple of reasons, you know, that I picked this bigger barrel right here. I could have went with something much smaller, especially for the engines that I'm running off of it. Anyhow, guys, I hope this helps. So if you need to, just fire me a message. And as always, I'm more than glad to help anybody that's wanting to tackle this guy right here. So on that note, I'm gonna get back off and probably expect maybe one to two more videos on the gasifier because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start covering the cooling system on the gasifier. Since my past video you've seen where I was running the generator off the sticks, I am constructing a whole new cooling system. I'm getting this thing shrunk down some and it's going to be a really jam up job. I'm going to show you how to build this using fence posts and stuff like that so you'll be able to do this with cheap materials. Now I did go purchase me a acetylene welder because that's something I am familiar with. So I'm basically going to be brazing my pipes together for my cooling system. And I'll show you guys how I've got all that put together when the time comes. So right now, just uh, use this video here to move to your next step. And let me know what you think. All right, before I forget, the gasket material that I'm using on the ash removal port, along with the top of the wood hopper lid, is one half inches wide by one eighth inch thick high temperature stripping. And on the door here, I actually doubled it up. I made it an inch wide 
That way I knew I'd get a good seal on the door. This stuff comes on a roll, actually, guys. Now, it's not cheap. I think I paid maybe 35 bucks for this or something like that. And I wouldn't use anything else because I know this stuff is going to hold up and it's going to last a long time. Not only that, there's enough material there probably for 10 gasifiers. I'll go ahead and place the number, the part number for this in the video, and you can Google it for yourself. You may find something that's comparable that's cheaper, but at least you'll have something to fall back on if you don't find anything else.